there's something special about being home, right? Um, earlier this week, I had a chance to, to get away. My wife and I, we had a chance to get away for a couple days, and we loved it. It was great. Adventure, fun, it was awesome. But there is something about going home that you're just like, oh, we're home. And uh, I think the reason is because, well, you have your own table with your own chairs. You have your own couch. Um, you have your own um, bed, your own bathroom, your own kitchen, your own pantry. The stuff that you like is normally in the fridge. Um, you know, it's just your house. So there's something comforting and secure about that. If your home is a safe place, then it's a place where you want to be at at the end of a long day of school or work. If home is a safe place, it's a place you want to come to after being gone for a long time. You know, it's welcome home. There's something so encouraging and peaceful and sustainable and secure about that. And that's a little bit of what it's like when we talk about this idea of being at the table with Jesus. That there's something um, unique, something um, satisfying, something secure, something peaceful, something uh, of, of comfort when we are at the table with Jesus. And we've been talking a couple weeks now about that idea. There is a Psalm, Psalm 23, that I think does a great job of talking about what that looks like to be in relationship with the Lord and to talk about who he is as a God, what he is like, and what, is our, what, what happens when we're at the table with Jesus. And I, so I love, I love Psalm 23. I think Psalm 23 the NLT version, New Living, is on your song sheet if you don't have a Bible with you. But I would encourage you to open up to Psalm 23, whether Bible, smartphone, or on the page that, that we provided for you as we look through and look at this great psalm by David. All right, Psalm 23. You there? You with me? All right. Excellent. And maybe, hey, Pursuit Church neighbors, if you happen to be listening, I encourage you open up Psalm 23. It's a great, great psalm. I think you'll receive a lot out of it. And so I want, us, I want to read this. Again, this is the New Living Translation. Listen to this. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. That sounds good right now, actually, doesn't it? <laughs> he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. What a great psalm. David, the psalmist, does a beautiful poetic job of talking about who God is as one who provides and cares for his people. Just a beautiful job at it. Now, he uses some interesting imagery, though. He uses the imagery of God being the shepherd and he being the sheep. It's really not a bad idea, if you think of it, because there's some really great things that we can pull from this for us, too. Other places, by the way, in the Old Testament and even in other Psalms, talk about God being the shepherd of his people. In the New Testament, the same imagery shows up. Jesus himself is recorded talking about what it looks like for him to be a good shepherd. And John records some words from him saying, I, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And see, we know that Jesus went to the cross for us and it showed how good of a shepherd he is that he laid down his life for his people, for the forgiveness of sin, and then rose again. Now, most scholars agree about Psalm 23 that David was already a king, and he was mature in life. He had already gone through quite a bit of life when he wrote Psalm 23, and that he probably was remembering back to his youth. Back when he was a, a, a young lad, he was a shepherd for his dad's sheep, for his flock. And so he did this probably for a very long time. So David, as king, knows what this relationship between shepherd and sheep is like because he was a shepherd and he did take care of sheep. And so David uses this 
this imagery to help pull out some very powerful things to remind us of who God is. Now, we're going to unpack some of this because there's some wonderful parallels to who God is and what he's done for, for people, for his people, because he is the one, the true, the good shepherd for us even today. All right, so I want to unpack that with us today because a good shepherd watches over his sheep. A good shepherd makes sure that his, his sheep, when they're hungry, have something to eat. And the good shepherd makes sure when they're thirsty, they have something to drink. A good shepherd makes sure that there, if there are any wolves out there, that he's going to protect those sheep and make sure that they are not within reach of the prey. A good shepherd is going to corral them at night, give them the safety of a place to sleep so they can sleep and rest when they need to. That's what a good shepherd is going to do. And so let's listen again for David's words about the good shepherd, our God, in relationship to us. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. See, David realizes, he recognizes that the Lord is his shepherd, very personal. Our God is a personal God. Yes, he is the shepherd to the people, to the flock, but he is your shepherd. If you call on him and his name and you are saved, he is your shepherd. He's a personal God and he cares for you and he cares about your life. He cares about what's going on in your life. He's attentive to where you are and what's going on. And then he recognizes that he doesn't need anything else. I lack nothing. In other words, everything I could ever need, I've got it. Like right now, I need some water because I'm a little parched. So if you don't mind, I'm going to come over here. All right, I'm getting there where David was, not, la- not needing anything. But he says, in the past, God provided. That's what he's saying. In the present, God is providing. And in the future, God will provide. You know, I want you to stop and think right now of your life. You know, David says he lacks nothing because he has a good shepherd that attends to who he is. Think about your life. Think in the past. Has God been faithful? Has he provided for you in the ways that some even now thinking about like, wow, that was amazing how God did that. See, if we can rest in his provision from yesterday, doesn't that help us trust in his provision for tomorrow? That we can stand there and say, I don't need anything. I lack nothing because my God is a good shepherd. and He's taking care of me. I think that's what David was doing there. So the second verse says, he makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me besides quiet waters and refreshes my soul. Now to really understand this imagery, we have to understand a little bit of what David's thinking about. So David, remember, he was a shepherd to the sheep and they were in this desert area. And so in the desert area, sheep just don't have all this grass to eat and lay in. They don't have all this running water everywhere to to drink from. Rather, they're in a desert, hot, dusty, desolate place. I think you can identify this morning, can't you? And the shepherd would need to lead the sheep to a small oasis of water. He would need to lead them to a place where there'd be small little areas of grass that would come up out of the ground around that water, he would lead them there so they could get something to drink. So they could eat some of this green grass or even lay down in it for rest so they could continue on their journey. And it's interesting that among the desert, there would be these small patches of grass, these small little oasis they would go to and the shepherd would guide his people to. Here's what's interesting. The sheep didn't know where this water was. The sheep didn't know where the grass was. They needed their shepherd to guide them through the desert to these small little oasis so they could receive the rejuvenation that they needed to continue in their journey. Our God does the same very thing for us today. Some of you may feel like you're in a, a place of life where you're, you're in this kind of wandering state. You, you feel like you're in some kind of desert. You maybe feel like, like you're in a place of, of uh, where you don't know what's gonna happen next. And maybe you're in a place of chaos where you're just like, man, everything's falling apart. Can I just remind you that our God is a good shepherd and he leads us to places where we are refreshed. See, we don't know where maybe where that is. Maybe we can't see what tomorrow holds and we can't. But our God, he is in control. And if we rest in his guidance, he can give us the very same thing that we need because he's a good shepherd. We can rest in his presence that he's with us and he's gonna restore us. 
Now, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Paul, this isn't Paul that wrote this. David wrote this. David says that he restores my soul. We read that he renews or refreshes. This word restore actually implies to rescue or to bring back. Is that me? My bad. Okay. This word restore means to rescue or bring back or bring home. And sheep has a, have a tendency to, to get lost. They, they just do. And we're equated to sheep quite a bit here in Scripture. So we have a tendency of getting lost, right? We have a tendency of thinking that we know the way and we get lost in our own way. But what does God do? He reaches out and rescues us. Jesus says, I've come to seek and save that's, that which was lost. And that's what Jesus' mission was. And so he goes out and he finds the lost and brings them back, brings them back home. And what David is saying is saying, I've been lost before. <laughs> like I've, I've, but he brought me back. He restored me. He restored me back into the relationship that we should have as I sit at the table with him and feast with him. This is a great thing. And then he doesn't just say that he's restored, but he says that he guides me along the right path for his name's sake. See, God not only rescues and reaches the lost, but he helps the found stay on the right path. He does that through his word. He does that through his presence. And that's the God that we serve. That's the God that we honored this morning in worship. And then David says this, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. You know, when you read it like that, it's kind of like, oh, okay. But if you read it like this, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. I mean, that's a little bit like, whoa, that was a dark valley, right? But why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me, Lord. Now, up to this point in this psalm, it's been kind of nice. This has been kind of, yeah, you know, nice springy day, you know? But then all of a sudden we get to the dark valley and we're like, whoa, what's going on? Wait a minute. Why are we in a dark valley? I thought we had a good shepherd that was leading us in the right path. So how all of a sudden are we in the valley of the shadow of death? I mean, how do we get there? Well, what's going on? If he's such a good shepherd, then, then why? Here's the thing. Yes, our shepherd protects us. But the shepherd may not remove the presence of the evil around us, but he will remove the fear of evil. That's what David says. Even though I walk through this dark place, I will fear no evil. See, David's recognizing that we're surrounded by evil. He's recognizing that the world we live in is, is under the, the sway of the evil one. I mean, he, he's not saying it like we see in the New Testament exactly, but, but that's what we're getting at is that God may not remove that evil right there, but he will give us the ability to not fear now, can he remove? You better, he can. But he will give us the ability to not fear when we go through those challenging times. When we're faced with something of opposition in our life, he's saying, hey, you know what? I can help you through that because I'm a good shepherd. And, you know, I think sometimes we think of it that way, like, well, if God is so good, then why am I in this such a rotten situation? God hasn't left you yet. In fact, if we look at where God is, he's actually providing a way through that situation. That situation is actually there, sometimes even divinely placed so that we can learn something valuable about ourselves and we can even open up our eyes brighter to what God is trying to do in our lives. And rather, we should say, Lord, would you help me through this situation? Because we're always gonna be going into some chaos of a situation. I mean, you're either leaving a problem or you're about to go into a problem, right? Every one of us is in that category. But the Lord says, you don't have to fear because I'm with you. In fact, some of you need to hear that this morning. You may be going through a very difficult situation, a very heartbreaking situation, but that does not mean that God doesn't care. That does not mean that God has left. In fact, it's in these very moments that we can draw even closer to God and lean on him to guide us in whatever the next step is. 
David continues, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David, at this point in his life, can easily look back on his life and see God's goodness and faithfulness. We sang about it. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. That's exactly what David's saying is, I look back and see the goodness of God, that he, uh, he's been with me. And all the days of my life, in fact, there's even more to come. We know that when we say yes to Jesus Christ, that we have a chance to live out the life he has for us now, but eternity to come in heaven someday. And David's saying, I can live with a confident hope that my God, he's got me. And his love, his goodness, they followed me yesterday and they're gonna be with me tomorrow. Now, I wanna wrap this up by going back to verse five. Going back to verse five. In fact, that's the reason why I chose Psalm 23 because we've been in this little mini series called At the Table with Jesus. And there's this verse that says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That's good. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. David knows that there are enemies present. And if you're talking about being a shepherd and a sheep, there is always somebody on the prowl for a good, tasty lamb chop, right? And so he knows that the enemy is out there wanting to get one of these sheep. The enemies are present. But our God still provides Our God still helps. Our God still heals. Our God still protects. Our God still anoints even in the presence of our enemies. I love that, that it's like, yeah, the enemy's out there, but that doesn't mean that God's not gonna continue to do what God is amazingly already doing. When we sit at the table of Jesus, he prepares a feast. In fact, that word prepare a table is actually better translated, he prepares a feast. And I want you to just picture what that feast looks like. I mean, go to Thanksgiving Day if you need to. But feast He prepares that even in in the face, even in front of our enemies. When we're surrounded by our enemies, the Lord just says, but my goodness is still here. You can still feast on my my love and my forgiveness and my goodness for you and what I have, and I'm protecting you. I'm here with you. I'm helping you through this. Yes, they're out there, but it doesn't change anything about what's going on right here. I love the line in this song, um, Um, Michael W. Smith sings it. It's called Surrounded. We've sung it before, but it goes, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You know the song I'm talking about? It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded by the enemies, but actually I'm surrounded by God when I'm at the table with Jesus because nothing has changed at the table. Recognizing that the enemy is there doesn't change what's going on because I'm actually surrounded by the Lord. I love that. See, we are surrounded by many factors that can overwhelm us and we feel defeated by, but we sit at the table and we need to rest in the assurance that we are in God's hands. But the enemy is out there, I know. But who is our enemy? I think we need to make sure we identify who the enemy is. The enemy is not your boss. The enemy is not your spouse. The enemy is not your neighbor. The enemy is not the government. The enemy is not a political figure. The enemy is not a group that stands for something that you don't believe in. That's not the enemy. Jesus tells us that the enemy is a thief, that the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy everything that God has provided. And the only enemy that's really trying to do that is Satan. The enemy of our soul is literally the only enemy that we have. Yes, you have people that don't like you. Yes, you have uh, circumstances that are just opposing you. But the real enemy is Satan. We have to identify that because we can start labeling people, oh, enemy, 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 enemy. But really the enemy, Satan, can use opportunities, can use situations, even can use people for us to look and go, oh man, I'm just being surrounded by. The story of Job shows us that. But here, we have to identify the enemy. And and how does he, here's the question though. How does the enemy hurt us if we're at the table of Jesus? Well, how does he do that? Well, 
he doesn't hurt us by coming up to us at the table and shoving us off our chair and then dragging us over into the valley of death. You know, that's not what he does. First of all, he doesn't have authority to do that, okay? He cannot just knock you off your chair if you're sitting at the table of Jesus. He does not have that kind of authority or power. He is limited. But how does he have any kind of influence if we're at the table of Jesus? And here's how. Because he is sneaky. And he's bolder than he should be. And what he does is he kind of grabs his own chair and he kind of sits at a distance from the table and he starts to talk. And he keeps talking. And he keeps talking and he keeps talking and he keeps talking and he just starts to fill the air full of all these things that hopefully we'll hear. That, and, and what he wants to do is distract us from what's going on at the table with Jesus. And what does he do? He starts throwing out these lies, throwing out these, these ideas that aren't, aren't really what God has planned for you. He begins to talk and talk and lies and just spews lies out so that we can hear. And if we give attention to those lies, we begin to hear things like, you know, you really aren't good enough. You really aren't if you think about it. I mean, remember that thing that happened last year? You, dude, you bombed that. Are you kidding me? What is wrong with you? Just give up. We begin to hear lies like, you know, uh, you deserve better than that. You know, that job and that boss, they just treat, but you should really consider something better. I mean, you are way better than that. You just need to just, you know what? You need to give them what they deserve. That's what you need to do. You need to show them who's boss. You need to, that word revenge, it's time. Bro, you have done your part. Just give it to them. He begins to throw these lies out at us. Like, you know, you should just jump ship. There's something better out there for you. The grass is greener on the other side. I'm telling you it is. You just need to go for it. We begin to say things like, you know, you're in a pretty hairy situation right now. Are you sure that God is with you? Are you sure that he's hearing your prayers? I mean, if he did, would this really be? And he just talks and talks and fills the air full of lies because he's the father of lies. And we need to fight against the enemy. Don't we agree? We need to fight against the enemy. We can't just roll over and go, okay, Satan, whatever you want to do. But here's the thing. We're not going to fight against the enemy by silencing the enemy. That's not the key. In fact, Pastor Louis Giglio has this quote. He says, you don't win the battle of your mind by fighting against the lies of the enemy. You win the battle of your mind by filling your mind with the truth of God's word. See, we may not be able to silence the enemy, but we can know the truth. When we know the truth, we actually shut the enemy up because we go, um, excuse me, liar. <laughs> That's not true. The truth is, and we can fill in the blank with the truth that we find in God's word. The best way to fight against the enemy is to fill our minds full of truth. Now, let me remind you about what David just said. David just said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. I know the enemy's out there, but the feast is still happening here. And his next statement is to anoint my head with oil. Now, I love this idea here because if we understand the idea of fighting against the enemy is actually filling our minds with God's word, then I want to unpack what does it mean to anoint a sheep with oil? Because this was a legit thing. And what they would do is, is they would anoint a, sh a sheep's head with oil. God anoints his people with the oil of his word. See, when you anoint a sheep, it's necessary to keep that sheep protected. It's a method of protecting that sheep. What they do is they anoint it with oil, they pour oil of it, and the sheep, because the sheep are easy targets for parasites and lice and flies, and they just like to... And they'll, you know, right there. Oh, I got that one. Okay. And they'll just... They come right to these parasites and this lice and these flies. They go to their head, and a, a sheep that's unoiled, an unoiled sheep, is easy target for these parasites and these little bugs to come in. But here's the deal. They don't just stay on the head. They actually crawl over to the ear, and they would go into the ear and find their way to the brain of the sheep. And they'd make themselves a cozy little home inside the cranium of the sheep. And they might be laying eggs, having a siesta, eating some meal, I don't know what, you know, a little bit of 
right brain is going to make the sheep turn left. I don't know what they're doing in there, but they're messing with the brain. In fact, the sheep will bang their head up against a tree or a rock because of the pain and the problem and the discomfort that's going on. And sheep are known to even crack their skull up against a rock to ease the suffering from the brain-eating parasites that are inside. When God anoints us with the oil of his word, it helps guard against the enemy's lies, the parasites of his lies. And so when we're saying, Lord, would you anoint my head with oil? What we're saying is, Lord, I wanna fill my mind with your word. Because in order for me to protect at your table, to protect me from the lies that are out there is I need to know who I am in Christ. I need to know who you are as a God. I wanna understand your love and understand your word so that I know the difference between the lies of the enemy and the truth that's at this table. And if I can encourage you, if I can just more than anything else is to be a man, a woman of God's word. Let it transform the way you think. May it be an oil that just covers to protect you from the parasites of the evil one. Because at the table of Jesus, we feast on his goodness. We feast on his care and provision like he's done yesterday, today, and he'll do tomorrow. And we're secure in him as we continue to allow him to anoint our head with oil. And then watch our cup overflow. The life and the purpose that he's given us just we get to see God in action when we, when we are people of his word anointed by him. If you want to see a little bit more about what it looks like to live a life filled with God's word, go to Psalm 119. It's a beautiful psalm talking about the power of God's word and uh, it's an encouragement to us all to hide in our hearts so that we can be people that are following and obeying the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me as we close in a word of prayer? Before we pray a prayer of dismissal, I want to give maybe somebody an opportunity here who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, an opportunity to say yes to him this morning. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you haven't said yes to him, and you haven't asked him to come into your life, then I want to give you that opportunity this morning. And it's simply acknowledging, God, you love me, you have a plan for me, and I admit that my sin's in the way, but I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and I can be forgiven, and I can be restored, and I want to follow after you. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, but you also rose from the grave, and you've conquered sin and death. And I confess, you are my Lord, you are my Savior today. And I want to be able to pray with you and so if, if you are here this morning and you want to accept Jesus in your life, then I want to pray for you. Just raise up your hand and say, Pastor Rex, pray for me this morning. I want to pray to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Anybody here this morning that wants to make that commitment to the Lord, and we'll pray with you. Anybody here? Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, you know where everyone's heart is here. Lord, most of us here know you as Lord and Savior. This is your church family that comes together and honors and worships you week after week, and I thank you for them. Lord, there are some who are uh, new to this church, maybe not new to you. They've known you and walked with you for years, and I praise you for them. There may be somebody here who doesn't know you as Savior. And we ask, Lord, that as you're speaking to us, we respond with the yes, Lord. I'm ready to commit my life to you to know you as my Savior. And thank you, Lord, that you say that if we call to you, that you answer. And that if we seek after you, that we'll find you. And that if we ask, that you forgive. So thank you for that this morning, Lord. Lord, those that are asking of you and receiving of you, Lord, would you meet them right where they are? Save, restore, and redeem. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. May we let your word anoint us so that we can know the difference between the lies of the enemy and the truth that we know that's in your word and at your table. Thank you for that, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. You are sent 
thank you for en enduring the heat out here. Um, but may the Lord just continue to bless you and direct you. Amen. See you guys. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to Him and give you a better understanding of His Word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org, and click on Connection Card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.